Uh, and today is the for regulatory Thursday and our medical device experts will provide us with a comprehensive insight for development and implementation of strategic planning, uh, validation, certification, and manufacturing of medical devices in Europe and the United States. The first talk will be given by Eric Bannon. Uh, Eric is Vice President of Regulatory and Clinical Affairs in AvaMed. And Eric is, we are very lucky because Eric is a dynamic executive with extensive global experience in successfully implementing creative regulatory and clinical strategies from development through commercialization. I have experience in multiple therapeutics areas, including endoscopy, orthopedics, and gastroenterology, and metabolic diseases. It recognizes for taking a hands-on approach while building high-performance teams to support company growth, experience it in successfully developing, leading, and implementing complex plan and directing successfully regulatory filing, and is a result-driven manager with the ability to adapt and anticipate changes in plans execution. We have some examples, and we know some companies that really help a lot, have a global uh, regulatory uh, strategy expertise with executing U.S. preserved mission, EDI um, 510K submissions, early and mid-state startups, and a strategic and tactical implementation of our clinical initiative. Uh, he's going to talk about medical device and practical with giving practical examples of the final regulatory strategy through the FDA review process. So thank you so much, Eric, to be with us today. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, Loris. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to uh, nice to have everyone on the uh, on the call here uh, today. Let me pull up my um, <clears throat> my slides. Um, I put just a couple of uh, slides together to help lead the uh, um, the conversation, um, but um, you know uh, I want to just kind of talk maybe uh, a bit freely as we kind of work through these about some of my uh, uh, some of my uh, experiences and and how it might help you kind of think about your strategy as you move forward. So um, just quickly, uh, I work uh, with uh, Alvamed. Uh, which is uh, based in the Boston area um, here in the United States. I've been with Alvamed for um, pretty close to uh, to three years, but I've spent a lot of my um, a lot of my past um, history is with small medical device companies, small startup companies. Um, and my guess is that a lot of the audience today uh, probably is uh, fits into that uh, fits into that category of uh, on the smaller side, looking to understand strategy, looking to understand, you know, what do I do with my product and things of that nature. So, um, hopefully, my uh, my past experience will be uh, will be helpful if you uh, you know if you, you think through that um, think through that process. So before I begin, like on, on the strategy side, just uh, a quick couple of comments on uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Um, they're obviously the governing body here for uh, medical devices. Um, they also cover um, all other products here um, in the uh, you know in the United States. So their breadth covers um, things like food, right? Uh, food safety, things of that nature. Uh, they have a hand in. Um, from a, a, a regulatory product overview standpoint, they're divided up into uh, three divisions. Um, one is CDRH, um, which is the Medical Device and Radiological Health. That is the division that, um, um, that oversees all uh, medical devices, radiological devices, um, diagnostics, et cetera. CEDAR is the uh, Drug Evaluation and Research. That's where all medications, um, prescription drugs, uh, things of that nature would be reviewed. Um, and then CBER, right, which is a uh, biological branch of, uh, of the FDA. They would then oversee, uh, you know, everything related to, uh, to biologics, uh, BLAs, um, you know, things of that nature, gene therapies, uh, those tend to be uh, included in that, um, um, you know, in that division. Um, FDA is, is located in uh, Washington, D.C., right, where uh, obviously a lot of the uh, um, the governmental agencies in the U.S. are, are located. Um, I've been there um, numerous times on, on uh, meetings with the FDA, mostly on the, the pre-sub side, um, and I'll talk about that in, uh, you know, in just a moment. 
Um, the other point on the Food and Drug Administration that maybe is outside the, uh, um, you know, outside this presentation, but that you should know, the Office of Device Evaluation that we're going to talk about today that reviews products before they're introduced to the market. Um, you know, that's one branch or one aspect of the work that they do. Obviously, the other work that they do is they have oversight on um, inspections, compliance, right? They monitor, um, you know, labeling, websites, right? Things of that nature that um, from a compliance standpoint, right? So they will, um, by, um, by requirement, will audit your facility. Um, you know, uh, routinely. I think it's uh, uh, they're supposed to visit a facility every uh, every three years or so. Uh, my experience is, especially on the small company side, that they do not necessarily um, follow that type of schedule. Um, so I just want to kind of give you a flavor of kind of how that is all laid out. Um, you know, within the uh, you know within the agency um, and whatnot. So. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a strategy and, um, you know, in my years, I've been in the industry close to 40 years. And when I first started um, in the regulatory industry, um, regulatory affairs and regulatory strategy was kind of like something you worried about um, when the product was done, right? Um, once you got your, your testing done, once you, you got your concept and your testing and you're, you're towards the, the completion of, of your process, um, they'd say, all right, what do we need to do to get this through, you know, the FDA? Or what do I need to do to, to get a, uh, um, a CE uh, certificate available? Um, and that's obviously has changed, right? Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done earlier on in the process to ensure a successful outcome. Um, and that's one of the, the, the key takeaways, uh, you know, from my standpoint for, for you here today, is that um, you want to think about this process early. Um, and, um, you know, we were talking when we first got on the call about how, uh, you know, a company had gotten a CE mark first and, hey, maybe they'll think about, you know, the FDA side soon, you know, since they're seeing success in the market, um, you know, in, uh, in EU. So that's part of the strategy as well, right? Where do I want to go? When do I want to try to enter a market? Because again, a lot of these companies are small. Um, you know, you can't necessarily enter five or six different geographies and markets at the same time. Right. So that's part of the process that you need to think through on when do you um, enter into this, uh, this regulatory strategy um, in your product development? Um, do you do it later on? Do you do, do it early? Um, and give some thought to, um, you know, how this fits in. Because oftentimes, and I'm sure companies can, can understand that, um, the work you do, let's say, for Europe, uh, a lot of that information will trans translate over, okay? Um, to the FDA and, and the filing that you do, and depending on the classification of your, your, your product, um, you may in fact need to do other work. You may need to do just because it worked for the EU doesn't mean it's going to work for you in the US. And as you put together your, you know, your strategy and you start thinking about that, um, you know, think about, well, make sure that work you do, uh, the testing, clinical evaluation, um, make sure the work that you do translates over um, to um, the process in the United States, because a lot of it will, not all of it will. And I'm going to give you just a, a quick example before I kind of run through um, the information on my slide here. <clears throat> um, there are situations where products need clinical evaluation, right? And you run your clinical evaluation in Europe. Um, oftentimes, that clinical evaluation will be required um, you know, in the, um, um, in the U.S. as well. Um, usually that is for, I'm going to say maybe 10% of the 510Ks, the pre-market notifications require clinical data. It's not very often. De novos um, generally require clinical data and PMAs do require clinical data, right? So, you know, if you're running a trial in Europe, you need to think about the FDA wants to know that the data you're generating in Europe will translate into the population in the US. They govern the US population. And if the standard of care, if the outcomes that you're following, um, the endpoints you're looking at in, in Europe are different than would be required for the population in the US, that data is not gonna translate over. Okay, so that's just an example of, of kind of how to think about strategy and how to kind of work through your process. So um, 
to the information on the slide here um, from a regulatory strategy standpoint. Here's kind of the top level kind of steps towards working towards a submission at a very kind of granular um, top level. So identify product classification, right? Um, at the end of my slide deck, um, I have hyperlinks to each of the resources the FDA has available to you. Um, the website has got a ton of information on it. Sometimes it's difficult navigating, you know, where to get that information. But the first thing you need to do is understand what the classification of your product is, okay? My next slide, I'll talk about that. Um, but generally, it's slide, their uh, classifications one, two, and three, okay? And those are in increasing risk and increasing complexity. Okay, that's the first thing you need to do to understand, well, what do I do and how do I do it? Review uh, available guidance documents, right? There's a, there's a ton of, of guidance documents out there that the FDA has, um, has provided. And these cover processes. So for example, the pre-sub, I'll talk about that in a minute, the pre-sub process, um, they have guidance document on that. They also have product specific guidance documents, right? For example, um, they have guidances on, um, you know, the data that they expect to see for a spinal um, fixation device, right? For a, uh, for a fusion device, as an example. So understanding um, what guidance documents are out there, how they apply to your product, sometimes gives you a roadmap towards under, toward understanding your regulatory strategy. Okay, that'll tell you maybe sometimes it helps with classifications, things of that nature. So with product development, create a, um, um, create a test plan. Um, understand the need for clinical data at this particular uh, point in time, right? So, um, and this is one of the, oftentimes, this is one of the big um, discussion points I would have with the agency, right? Companies, it, the world's changed, right? So. Um, it used to be that that companies wanted to uh, try to avoid a clinical trial at all costs, right? It's time consuming. It's very costly. Um, you want to try to get your product on the market and be able to execute your clinical trial as a post-market trial. It's a lot easier to do um, and whatnot, but um, understanding how that works and understanding that, that, you know, how that fits into a test plan um, is really important and maybe one of the points you want to approach the FDA on in advance of any kind of regulatory submission, right? <clears throat> Item four is consider engaging the FDA through the, the pre-submission process. Okay, um, I've used this a lot. I, I advise companies to, um, to use this um, where it makes sense, where they aren't clear on where their classification is. They aren't clear with what testing I need to do or um, <clears throat> they need confirmation, right? Oftentimes, as an example, um, <clears throat> you require uh, a lot of animal data, right? Animal studies are, you know, they take a long time, they cost a lot of money. Do you need them? And if you do need them, um, you know, what are the appropriate time points? What are the outcomes? You know, things of that nature are, you know, some, some things to consider, right? <clears throat> and I'll talk uh, more extensively about the pre-submission process. And finally, um, electronically file a submission. I, and I say electronically in quotes, because the FDA doesn't actually take it over the website. It's not in the cloud. Their electronic um, submission process is you put it on a thumb drive, print out a copy of the cover letter for your submission and FedEx or, you know, send it into the uh, document control center at FDA. So that's kind of, you know, the final, uh, the final uh, out output on, on that process. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, regulatory classifications. <clears throat> um, there's class um, one, two, and three. Uh, um, class ones are exempt. You still need to document your, um, um, your decision why they're exempt. And these can come out of the classification. Um, and um, there is a classification database where you can search the description of your product and get a product code and a classification from that. Um, second is pre-market notification. That's 510K. Um, these are generally class twos. Um, I'm going to say in the United States, 90%, 95% of the products that make it to market here are in the pre-market notification process. Okay. Um, de novo, um, that is a, um, a process where you don't quite fit in the pre-market notification um, um, 
process, the 510K process. And the 510K process is one of substantial claims. You're showing that your product is the same as a product that's already out there. Right? It's already marketed. You're showing that through testing and your intended use, your indication of use, that you're the same as what's currently out there. Um, de novo is <clears throat> a process where you don't quite fit in. Maybe your indication for use is different. Maybe you have a design that's different enough that there's questions about this testing that you, you did. Um, that is a process that the de novo process is a process where you would enter in that process and you would eventually be classified as a class two, but it's a much more lengthy process. <clears throat> and finally, um, there's pre-market approval. Um, these are uh, class three um, products. They take a long time. They always need um, clinical data. Um, this is a, a, you know, a multi-year generally process with the agency. Once you file the PMA, it's generally a year or so of review with the, uh, with the FDA. So when I talk about review guidance documents, I talk about this in a bit, it, it gives you clarification on the potential classifications that you would fit into, um, considerations for testing um, that the FDA might expect. Um, and then um, you also gives you the opportunity to identify consensus standards, right? You don't want to like, well, how do I test this? You know, you don't want to um, reinvent the wheel, right? All the standards that the FDA accepts, um, all the ISO standards, all the, the IEC standards um, that they accept are listed in this database. And the, uh, the link is at the end of my slides as well. So really important process to be able to um, to be able to get your uh, um, uh, understand what these documents are out there and, and how to use them. So aligning product development um, and the test plan, you need to create a test plan that's going to meet the requirements, right? You can't go into the FDA and say, well, I think this is what I need. You got to be pretty high confidence so that you can get out of the process in a reasonable time point and not come up with approval or a what's for the 510k process and non substantial letter. So these are kind of some of the things to, to think about, right? Um, verification testing, right? This is output from management process, your 14971. You know, you put together a matrix of inputs, outputs. You identify these products or this um, testing is generally, you know, what you would use. Biocompatibility for 10993, electrical safety as an example, sterilization, um, you know, whether it's ETO um, or gamma, um, they want to know how you're sterilizing, what your sterility assurance level is, expiration date, right, for sterile devices, your shelf life, you know, how you test that. And then um, for pre-market notification, perform your device performance versus, um, you know, other, uh, other devices or standard of care, right? These are examples, but think about in your product development process, not at the end, you could see how at the end of the process, you go through this, this regulatory strategy and you say, oh boy, I, I didn't realize I need to do this type of testing or I need to um, you know, test to the standard. I didn't do that, right? You don't wanna do that at the end of the process. You wanna make sure you understand that upfront, okay? <clears throat> So just quickly on the pre-submission before I get to some, some examples, um, you know, the FDA likes to say we're open for business, right? To provide clarification and feedback. A couple of things to consider um, on this process. Generally, you would put together a submission um, to them. Um, the one I just did for, for um, you know, a company um, that I'm working with um, in, in Europe, um, that, that submission was approximately, I'm going to say 25 or 30 pages, okay? It's background on the device. Um, it's uh, information around what you propose for the testing. And most important, it lists up to five questions you want the FDA to provide feedback on, right? Those are the questions that you want answered so you understand, you know, what to do from a, uh, a future submission. Right, things that you can cover: a choice of predicate devices for a 510k, indication for use, intended use is an important one. Right, uh, making sure you fit into you know the population that you want to use your device. Proposed test plan, the need for clinical data. I talked about that earlier. Right, it's an important consideration. Do I need clinical data? When do I need that data? Can I do it post market, etc. Okay, um, so this process is one that um, I think is really important. 
So I want to provide some examples of things that I've done, you know, really in the last, I'm going to say five or eight years on projects that I've worked on, where um, that strategy has come into play, and we've used that pre-submission process process um, to be successful. So um, the first one was a collagen ACL reconstruction device. Um, this was, you know, the company was considering we were going to be the PMA, the class three um, product, long time, long process to get through. Um, and we, we came up with the idea of, hey, listen, we had clinical data um, already on the product. Let's put together a meeting. Let's see if we can fit into it de novo. Right. We can use our, our process, our, our um, clinical data for de novo. Um, and it was successful. Right. We we're able to present our clinical data during our meeting. Um, the, uh, the FDA agreed that a de novo where you get classified as a class two product um, was an appropriate regulatory pathway. You know, that's an example of engaging the FDA and cutting, I'm going to say, um, you know, up to a year, year and a half off um, um, the timeline to bring a product to market. Okay, so that's one example of, of how this is, you know, worked effectively. Um, my second example is a negative wound uh, pressure uh, wound therapy dressing. Um, this is one that um, was clearly a class two device, um, but the company wasn't clear on um, exactly what testing I needed to do or had variations to the testing that, um, that they would like to do. We met with the agency, we presented um, you know, that, um, um, that test plan to them, got the feedback that we, we needed. Um, and just last month, we've got the clearance, we got the, uh, the 510K clearance to, uh, to come through um, you know, on that product. Um, my next example is a, uh, uh, a GI intestinal implant. This was for um, a uh, for short bowel syndrome um, in pediatrics. So very specialized. Um, the company in this case was going for what's called a HDE, humanitarian device exemption. This is a reduced review process for very small markets um, to encourage industry to introduce devices for very specialized needs where perhaps the, uh, the breadth of market is, is not attractive from a, uh, um, um, from a commercialization standpoint. Um, in this one, we, um, we successfully understood from the agency um, what animal data we needed. You know, the, uh, the FDA at first wanted, well, we want your animals to follow up for six months, for example. At the end of the discussion, we agreed on we could submit our, uh, our application to them with three-month data. Um, and have the six month data if the FDA had questions. So right there, we cut down the timeline and the number of animals down um, pretty significantly. We also clarified um, the clinical study design um, that, the, age, that the, uh, the company was going to use. Um, the last two examples I had was, an, was a bone marrow aspiration biopsy device. Um, this, these are all small companies. This one is a virtual company. They had two people um, in the company currently. It was started by, a, as often often the case, started by a uh, uh, by an MD um, at, down at uh, at Yale here in the U.S. Um, we had trouble identifying a predicate um, device and an animal test plan, and we went through three. Um, pre-submissions, so it's pre-submissions and two supplement submissions with them, and we got them off of the, well, we're not sure you're a 510K device, and we're able to agree this looks like a 510K in the animal study. So my important, my, my important point here is the fact that don't look at a pre-submission as a one and done. You may need to go back to the agency with clarification or additional information as you generate it to make sure your strategy is successful. Um, finally, uh, neurological device for hydrocephalus. This is um, a company I'm working with currently. Um, you know, we're using uh, sequential pre-submissions. Um, you know, this is a PMA device, and we've started with a pre-submission that looks at, you know, first um, device testing. For, to support a IDE, which is a investigational device exemption. And then secondarily to a clinical protocol, just because of the breadth of the work and the breadth of the testing um, was so large. So, um, you know, those are examples of, um, 
you know, using the FDA process, having a strategy together up front before you, you approach the FDA and identifying your specific points uh, that you need to clarify before you consider moving forward with, uh, you know, with your program. Um, and um, Lourdes, I don't know if you're circulating these, um, um, these slides or they're available to, uh, to the yes, attendees. Yes, yes, we will okay. put it for the participant. Yeah, we Perfect. will put it in the, in the so, website if it's, that's okay. Great. So here are all the, the, the resources that I talked about um, you know, in my presentation. Um, that uh, you can access and take a look at and understand, you know, some of these are guidance documents, some are databases that you can search, what similar products are out there, what testing they did, right? This, these are all valuable resources. Um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, any questions you have or, uh, um, you know, clarifications, things of that nature, here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to, uh, to reach out and uh, um, I'd be happy to help out if I can. That's uh, what I have. Um, there's Q and A for a few minutes, correct? Exactly. So I think that uh, Ruben has a question that he is very happy to listen to you, and he wants to help also some other companies that are here. So Ruben, can you hear? Us? Uh, this is Ruben Molina from Initius. Uh, <laughs> oh, hey, Ruben, how are you? Uh, I, I'm fine. Uh, we, we work with Eric. Uh, doing the pre-sub. So uh, normally here in Spain, we don't normally do the, the pre-sub. We just go uh, to, to the FDA. And uh, I would like you to explain what are the main uh, key points that uh, performing a QSAP uh, add to every like a startup or something like that, because we normally don't do it here in Spain. So I'm sorry, your question was just talk about why doing the pre-sub? is uh, what value at uh, a pre-sub to, uh, to the regulatory strategy of a company. Yes, okay. Company like yeah, yeah, so, you know, as I talked a little bit about the value, you know, um, is reducing timeline. Um, it is um, potentially um, reducing cost for the company as well. You know, you can enter into a regulatory process, um, like you said, and listen, earlier on in my career, um, I've worked for, you know, I'm going to say in my career, eight or 10 companies, right? And oftentimes we would just go ahead and submit that, that, you know, submission and hope that things came through okay and we got the clearance, we got the approval, right? Um, this process, that's, this pre-sub process allows you to understand, you know, um, you know, what the classification is right? What you testing you may need to do, right? And understand, you know, even to the point of should I enter the US market, right? Is it too difficult? Have I got enough money and resources and time to enter the US market? This is a, a process that um, from a value standpoint, it really doesn't cost you a lot of, of money to go down this road right? You don't have to pay the FDA for this, right? Unlike other submissions that are currently, you need to pay a fee for, you know, all you need to do is work with someone like myself, or, you know, even look at the guidance documents and do it yourself. That value um, for your company is you can understand exactly what it is you need to do, and understand perhaps from a strategy standpoint, well, okay, that's way too much work for me, or I need to, you know, perhaps consider doing the FDA a little bit later, or, hey, this looks like it's a reasonable approach for us, we can enter a new market, um, you know, on our own. Um, that's one of the largest markets in the world. So understanding the, the, you know, the, the, the issues with the agency, um, the pre-sub allows you to, to do that. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric and, and Ruben. Is also uh, Ruben is a very successful company as is growing a lot, and uh, he wants to help to other companies too. So I really appreciate the question and also your answer because it's true that and also the VCs are going to ask all of that and are going to review and even if you go through the AC accelerator or any kind of. Um, 
financial aids is the evaluators are going to review very much uh, how is your regulatory pathway, uh, how, and so if you have these possibilities um, uh, to improve time and um, resource and all of that, that is wonderful. So thank you so much, all, all of you. I don't see more questions, so I'm going to follow up with, the, we are going to follow up with the, the second talk that will be given by Eduardo Garrido. Uh, Eduard, one second. Uh, one second. So Eduardo is licensed in chemistry and is a PhD in biomedicine, who has been working in the regulatory field for three years in Asphalium. He is now focused on medical device, even through he has worked in the authorization and maintenance of medical products. In his day-to-day, -day, he cites manufacturers to obtain the C mark of their device or assist in the development of new products by providing a regulatory perspective. Additionally, he is also actively participating in Horizon 2020 project funded by the European Commission, providing with regulatory knowledge in order to ensure that the innovative device that are being developed and take into account the regulatory consideration. Eduardo is going to talk about, uh, or are going to, he's going to give us an overview of medical device regulation in Europe. Thank you, Eduardo. So, um, as Lourdes was saying, I'm, I'm Eduardo Garrido from Asphalian. Uh, I'll be giving this second talk about an overview of medical device regulation uh, in Europe of these regulatory Thursdays of BTS Granada. So first I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some general in introduction of concepts because uh, up until now we've been talking uh, with the, the nice talk that Eric Bannon gave a moment ago, we were talking about medical devices, but these were medical devices in the United States. We're gonna focus now on, on, on Europe. So what is a medical device in Europe? It's any kind of instrument, apparatus, appliance, software, implant, reagent, material, or any other article. It's intended for human use, okay? For one or more specific medical purposes. These medical purposes can include diagnosis, prevention, prediction, treatment, or alleviation of diseases, injuries, or handicaps, okay? They can also include investigation, replacement, or modification of physiological or pathological processes. And they also include um, control or support of conception, okay? It is important to highlight though, that the, these medical devices cannot achieve uh, their, their medical purpose by pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic means. Okay, if the principal mechanism of action of the product you're developing is based on pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic means, then it's not a medical device according to European regulation. So now that we have clear what a medical device is, let's talk about what it's not a medical device. Okay, because there are several uh, products that are quite borderline with, with medical devices, and it's important to properly qualify your device once you, once you start working on it. Okay, so Products that are borderline with, uh, with medical devices but are not medical devices can include medicines, food supplements, cosmetics, biocides, and research use only products, okay? All these kind of products are excluded from the regulation of medical devices and have to be uh, addressed by other legislations. But it's important to do a proper qualification at the beginning uh, of the development of, of your product, okay? So once we know what a, a medical device is, how do we place it on the European market? Okay, in order to place your device on the market, you've got to get this CE marking. Okay, you might have seen this uh, logo on the left side of the screen, uh, which can go either alone or in a combination of numbers. If it goes alone, it means that the manufacturer himself did the self-certification. If it goes with some numbers, it's because it includes the number of the notified body. We will talk about this in a second, okay? But this CE marking, you've got to understand as a concept, like what you have to do to get authorized in the European uh, economic uh, European area, okay? So what's, what's the landscape? Up until now, uh, until 2017, we had these directives. We had the Active Implantable Medical Devices Directive and the Medical Devices Directive. But in 2017, we had these uh, regulations released, okay? We had one regulation for uh, medical devices and one for in vitro diagnostic medical devices, okay? The, the one that we're talking today is about regulation 2017-745, which is specific for medical devices, okay? As I was saying, this was released in 2017, but we're still in a transition period, okay? It started in 2017, and it was supposed to end in 2020, but uh, due to the COVID outbreak, it's been postponed until May 2021. So we still have a few months to finish um, adapting to this, to this new regulation. So why was this 
uh, new regulation released. Well, there were many changes to, to implement uh, in respect to the um, directives. Okay, here we can see some examples, but for instance, the regulations of scope were, were falling behind and taking into account the, the technology involved in the, the devices. Okay, so the regulations uh, have a broader scope uh, when compared to the directives. They are more inclusive. They include more different kind of, of devices. Also, the classification of the devices uh, had to be updated because they were not taking into account the technology of the new kinds of devices. Additionally, uh, new product specific requirements are being implemented with the regulation. For instance, if your device includes medicinal products or if they include nanomaterials, they have product specific requirements that are being included with this regulation. Also, the clinical evaluation requisites are being expanded uh, with the regulation. They're more defined and they're, and they're broader than in, with the directive. Uh, there are also post-market surveillance obligations that are being uh, implemented. This is made to ensure that the device that is placed on the market is safe and it keeps track of the device once it's placed on the market to see if it has any issues. Plenty of changes within the economic operations have been implemented, like the relationship between them, what are the responsibilities of each economic operator. Also changes to um, integral drug device combinations have been implemented with Article 117, we'll talk about it in a moment. And we also have changes in the notified bodies assessment changes in the traceability of the devices, which is going to be the UD, UDMED, we're going to talk in a minute. Then we also have this figure of regulatory compliance responsible that has been implemented with, uh, with the change of, of legislation. Okay, These are some just, uh, just a few of the concepts that have been introduced with the regulation, and we're going to focus on these three in green. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit uh, more about the classification uh, and drug device combinations, and then UD, UDMED to give you uh, some clues. But taking into account that this is not an exhaustive list, Okay, there might be more changes. So the classification, um, what happened with the classification? Up until now with the directive, we had 18 rules to classify uh, the device. And now with the regulations, we have 22 rules, okay? Why? Because there have been new rules added to properly classify devices that were not being taken into account before. For instance, software. Uh, when the directive were put in place, mm, artificial intelligence, for, for instance, was not uh, uh, on the state of the art. But right now, it's becoming more and more common to have an artificial intelligence software that is driving your device. So this rule, what it's doing, it's uh, assessing if you're, uh, the, the class of risk of your device depending on the kind of uh, software your device includes. Another example would be nanomaterials. In the directive, it was not contemplated because it was not a common thing back then. But right now, it's way, way more common to have nanomaterials in your device. So there's a specific rule for this kind of devices, okay? So we said that we've got 22 rules, but how does this work? Okay, you're developing a product and you want to know how you've got to classify your device. So the first thing you've got to know is what's your intended purpose? That's something you've got to define very well. Like what is my device going to do and for what patient and who's gonna use it? That's something you've got to define it pretty well. Once you know this, you've got to analyze all the four characteristics, which are the duration of use, the invasiveness of your device, the implantability of your device, and if your device is active or not, okay? For duration of use, you only have to look if it's transient, short-term, or long-term. These are, and there are a specific thresholds of time that are defined uh, within the regulation, which indicate what kind of device your device is. Then invasiveness, you've got to consider if your device penetrates or not inside the body of the patient. Okay, this is something you've got to consider or not. It may be uh, on the surface of the skin or it may go in uh, the, the body of the patient. And you've got to analyze if your device is implantable or not. And you've got to decide if it's active or not. What does it mean if it's active or not? It, uh, a device is considered active when it depends, it relies on a source of energy other than the generated by, by the body or the gravity uh, of, of the patient, okay? Once you take into account all these, all these points, you've got to, uh, identify which rules of, uh, of the regulation apply to your device, okay? Once you identify these rules, you will have pretty laid out the class of your device, okay? Yeah, your device can range from uh, class one to class three, being one the lowest risk and three the highest risk. If your device is a class one, then it's self-certified. What does that mean? It means that the, um, the own manufacturer can uh, undergo its CE marking process, okay? It doesn't rely on a notified body to assess the conformity of the device. 
On the other hand, if your device is a class 2A, class 2B, or class 3, you require of the involvement of a notified body. That means that somebody else, an entity, is going to be assessing that your device complies with the regulation. Okay. If you're a class one uh, device manufacturer, it doesn't mean you don't have to comply with the regulation. You have to, and you have to compile the information that uh, demonstrates that you do. It means that no organization is going to be assessing that you do fulfill the requirements. Okay. So uh, the second point I want to talk about of, of new things about regulations are uh, is Article 117. This article affects uh, drug device combinations. For instance, you might be developing a, a, a device that it's used to um, administer a, medic a medicinal product. Okay, so this, this article would totally affect you. Drug device combinations are uh, combinations of medical and medicinal products with uh, medical devices, and they can either be integral or non-integral. This uh, article only affects uh, integral DDCs, okay? And what does this uh, article say? Well. It says that you've got to provide with a notified body opinion. Why? Let's see. Up until now, what you had is if you if you had a class one, you also uh, you could either provide the CE uh, declaration of conformity or you provide it with a GC, GSPR checklist. That means you demonstrated that you were complying with the um, with requirements, either providing with the declaration of conformity or with a checklist mentioning all the requirements and how you uh, you fulfill them. In the, in, the class, uh, in the case of um, class 2A or 2B or 3, you had to provide with the certificate of conformity, which was given by a notified body, or you could uh, provide with this GSPR checklist, but nobody was checking um, the requirements of, of, of the device. Now, what has been implemented is that a notified body has to assess your device, even if your device is not undergoing CE marking, okay? This is a new change of, um, of the regulation. And the third change I, I wanted to mention, it's UD and UDAMID. What is UD? UD is a system that will allow the identification and traceability of the devices. It's a series of codes that will be given to the device. Um, it's not just one single code. It's going to be like several, several parts. We've got the basic UDDI, then we've got UDDI and UDPI. It's a bit of a mess of, uh, of codes, but you've got to get used to it. And it will be used to track your device, like to identify where your device was manufactured, where it was sterilized, where it was distributed, where it was sold. So you can track exactly all, uh, all the pathway of your device, okay? And this is gonna be really linked to Udamed. Udamed is going to be, because it hasn't been launched yet, uh, it's gonna be a, a database for medical devices, uh, and both for in vitro medical devices as well in Europe, okay? Here, all the manufacturers will have to register, all the economic operators will have to register it. And there will be plenty of information regarding clinical investigations or market civilians or vigilance. These models are gonna be released uh, as soon as they are ready, but it's not gonna happen at least until 2022. So let's let's talk a bit uh, in the last minutes about CE marking of devices. How do you CE mark your device? So in order to CE mark your device, you need two basic things. First, uh, technical documentation, and second, a QMS. It's mandatory for manufacturers in Europe to have a quality management system based on ISO 13485, uh, okay? Once you have these two things, you can undergo C marking, and there's some entities that may participate or might not, depending on your device, uh, on, on the C marking process. The first, it's notified body. If your device is higher than plus one, then you will require a notified body. If not, you don't need it. And then there are medicinal product competition authorities, which will involve uh, in products that incorporate a medicinal product as an ancillary substance. And then we'll have also expert panels that will be assessing certain kinds of, of uh, products. So we were talking about this technical documentation. What is the technical documentation of medical device? Well, this is a core information that will demonstrate that you comply with the requirements, okay? What should this technical documentation include? Well, you need description and, in, and specification, information to be supplied by, by the manufacturer. This means uh, the, the instructions for use that you're going to provide to the patients or to the users, the labels that are going to be uh, included in the, in the device. You really need to uh, really well define the design and manufacturing steps of your device. How did you get to the point where your device is? That's something you've got to explain very well inside this technical documentation. How, what's the life story of your device? Okay, And then you also have to explain how do you manufacture it. You have to include this TSPR uh, checklist. This is uh, it's mandatory. You've got to include these requirements that are listed in Annex 1 of uh, the Medical Devices Regulation. And you also have to mention 
which standards uh, you're following in order to demonstrate uh, compliance with, with these standards, okay? You will also have to perform a risk management uh, task uh, on your device. You have to have a risk management plan in place. Uh, and then you also have to include all the testing you have done to your device, like all the validations, all the usability data you've got on your device, the biocompatibility data on your device. Also very important, the clinical evaluation, we will get later on clinical uh, data that has to be provided. Um, this has to be included in your, in your technical document. Okay. And besides that, you also have to have in place a post-market surveillance plan. And finally, you need a declaration of conformity. Okay. It's a lot of information. All of it should be controlled uh, within your quality management system, which, as I said, is got to be based on ISO 13845. Okay. So what you do with this, all this data is demonstrate uh, compliance with the requirements that are laid out in the, in, the, in the regulation. Okay, If you go to Annex 1, you will find all the requirements that are applicable to your device. What you have to do as a manufacturer is identify which requirements are specific to your device. Okay, You should go through all, all these requirements and identify which ones apply to you and which ones not, Okay, and then demonstrate compliance with them. So once you've got all these uh, requirements identified and you're gathering this technical documentation, what you, what you will have to do is undergo a conformity assessment route. Okay? There are three uh, assessment routes identified in the regulation. Depending on the class of your device, you will have to undergo one and another. For instance, if you're a class one, you only have to compile your technical documentation. There is no conformity assessment. But if you are a class 2B, you have to follow either an Annex 9 or Annex 10. Okay? You have to go to the regulation and see which, which one of them you can follow. I mean, you have a, a summary here in this slide, but as you can see, you, can, you have several options depending on your classification, okay? Take into account that besides this, besides these um, uh, specific conformity assessment routes, you also have specific additional procedures that you have to undergo depending on your device. For instance, if you have a medicinal product included in your device, you have to go to a competent authority to assess the quality and safety of this uh, medicinal product. Okay, there are specific uh, procedures to your device depending on the technology used in your device. So last to recap, I'd like to make this uh, a slide with the milestones to see marking, which is a process you should follow when, once you want to get your device to the market. So the first you should do is make certain your device is a medical device. Then once you know it's a medical device, it fulfills the requirements uh, uh, of, the, of the regulation definition, then you have to classify the device. Okay, according to the rules of Annex 8. Then once you have classified your device, you've got to uh, go to Annex 1 of the, uh, of the medical device regulation and identify which requirements are applicable to your device. Then you have to demonstrate uh, compliance with these uh, requirements using standards and guidelines. This should be followed uh, by the testing of your device following the standards you have identified as, uh, as applicable to your device. You will have to perform a risk assessment and the clinical evaluation. This is something that is usually done in parallel. You know, like you don't do step by step, but you take several steps at the same time. You do this risk assessment and then just followed by a clinical evaluation. And then you have to compile all, all this information in a technical document, okay? And then you've got to make certain that you have a quality management system in place that is controlling all this documentation, okay? With this, you can undergo a conformity assessment and get your C marking of, of your device, okay? I uh, think this should be all. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you, you might have. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Eduardo. Now we are going to have our third talk uh, that is very convenient because uh, Maria is going to talk about sufficient clinical evidence for clinical evaluation report. Uh, that combined very well with the talk uh, with uh, Eduardo and uh, Maria. Let me give you some background information. She is uh, is doctor uh, Dr. Nakon. Uh, she founded AKRN Scientific Consulting in 2015. After working nearly 15 years in the regulatory and clinical development of medical device technology and commercialization of health care products. She's a doctor of cell biology at the Stockholm University in Sweden and has completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Bologna in Italy. 
Maria, as you will see, is fluent in English, Spanish, Italian, French, and Sweden. And she's going to tell us, we were discussing before, about sufficient clinical evidence for a clinical evaluation report. Thank you, Maria, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Eduardo, for such a great background and introduction. It's really helpful to kick off the, the discussion that I wanted to provide today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what is sufficient clinical evidence and, and actually what is clinical evidence, not just what is sufficient clinical evidence. And, and to collect clinical evidence, you need to have a strategy. So we're going to go through that a bit. What could a clinical data strategy be uh, and talk about sources of, of uh, to collect your clinical evidence. And this clinical evidence and the collection of it, it's, it's uh, created in a new um, template that is an MDR requirement, just as Eduardo spoke before. And it's called the Clinical Evaluation Plan. And we, the acronym for that is CEP. And we put that strategy in place. We say which, source, which sources we're going to look for our data. And that plan is a really core document and it's part of your QMS system moving forward. And especially if you want to be in compliance with, with the MDR. Uh, we're gonna look into that, some definition and requirements. And then uh, part of the clinical evaluation is you can have either a, a clinical investigation or you can provide a lot of clinical evidence through literature review. So I wanted to go through uh, some of the basic steps of how do you do this literature review? What are the guidance documents and, and the requirements that you have to adhere to to be in compliance with the MDR? So clinical evidence, there are a couple of uh, important um, definition. So the, the MDD, so the Medical Device Directive, as well as the MDR, the Medical Device Regulation, are really great to study in detail because they, at the beginning of the regulation or the directive, they provide a big section on definitions. And, and, and to make sure we speak the same language, it's really good that we, we define the terms and that we really understand them uh, because there's a lot of assumptions and, and sometimes people are not so fluent in the clinical regulatory terminology. So I put up here a couple of really key uh, parameters when we are discussing clinical data and clinical evidence. So clinical evidence, according to the medical device regulation, is clinical data and clinical evaluation results pertaining to device of sufficient amount and quality to allow a qualified assessment on whether the device is safe and achieves the intended clinical benefits when used as intended by the manufacturer. So you can think that this is just a lot of word, but basically every word here is really important. It ties back to what Eduardo mentioned, that this device is safe and performs as it's intended. It talks about the intended purpose or the intended use, which needs to be defined. Otherwise, you cannot design what will your clinical evidence be if you don't know what your intended purpose is. And then, um, I think uh, we've had uh, in the regulatory business uh, the last year, it, it's been a lot of debate around what is sufficient clinical evidence. And, and there is nobody that actually knows what, when is sufficient sufficient. That is really going to be a question of your uh, rationales and you providing the data that you have. And it depends a little bit also on the notified body, uh, how they will interpret what is sufficient and not. But clinical performance is the ability of the device um, uh, resulting from any direct or indirect medical effect, which stems from its technical and functional characteristics, including diagnostic characteristics, to achieve the intended purpose as claimed by the manufacturer, thereby leading to the clinical benefits for the patient when used as intended by the manufacturer. So again, you have to define again well your intended purpose to know how you are going to design and evaluate your clinical performance. Uh, clinical benefit, it's the positive impact the device has on the health of an individual expressed in terms of meaningful, measurable, patient relevant clinical outcomes, including outcomes related to diagnosis uh, or a positive impact on patient management or, or public health. So I think a change here also 
over the last years is how we are uh, defining clinical be benefit because the patient relevant clinical outcomes have become much more important than previously. It's actually really highlighted now in any type of clinical research that we do that uh, questionnaires and, and, and uh, the feedback from patients are becoming more and more important, both for uh, authorities and, and from an ethical point of view when we're designing clinical trials. And then finally, the intended purpose, which is like the holy grail in medical devices. It's the, uh, the use for which the device is intended according to the data supplied by, by the manufacturer on the label. It's also provided in the instructions for use in any promotional and safe material. Uh, and it's specified by the manufacturer and then used in the clinical evaluation. So the intended purpose is something that as a manufacturer you it's really why you designed your product and why you, 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 you probably early on thought that there is an unmet medical need and you decide to, to solve that unmet met medical need, but that has to translate into a regular ter uh, regulatory terminology and, and that's sort of packaged into an intended purpose. So I'll continue. When is clinical evidence sufficient? Uh, you need to demonstrate the safety and the performance. So tying back to the previous definition, definitions that we provided. So the clinical benefits needs to outweigh the potential risks. So in the MDR also, there's a very strong focus now compared to previously under the MDD, again, that the risk benefit analysis is more and more important. This is uh, part of your clinical evaluation plan. It's part of your, the, the generation of your entire technical file. It's part of when you design clinical investigations, clinical trials, uh, you really, it's, it's clear that nothing is 100% free from risk. It's impossible, but you need to have a very good rationale and you need to do a good risk assessment to say that the risks, um, uh, that the benefits out, outweigh the risks. And, and sometimes that's really difficult because of course, when we move into technologies, also as, as the previous speaker mentioned in, in nanotechnology and therapies that are really leading edge and, and, and opening up to new type of therapies that we have never been treating before or working in before from a techno technological perspective, the risk can be enormous because we are really moving into uncharted territory. So um, it's very important that you think uh, from a holistic perspective also and see how does this benefit the patients and how does this benefit the society uh, as a whole? I think that's also a very relevant uh, parameter. Um, and does this risk, risk benefit, sorry, risk benefit ratio, does it has, have an impact on the state of the art? So the state of the art is also really our golden standard. What are we currently doing? So uh, can this, uh, are we doing something that it, it mean, may mean some more risk, but we are also seeing some benefit and it's gonna help advance the entire field uh, as a whole and thereby affecting the state of the art. So how to get data? Uh, so we can speak about, you can have data by doing a clinical trial and you can do uh, get data by looking at uh, uh, doing a clinical evaluation and, and looking at the equivalent data that you collect from other devices. So I think it's uh, here we have put the reminder, a clinical investigation does not mean clinical evaluation or the opposite. So if you say, I need to do a clinical evaluation, it doesn't mean that you have to run off and do a, a clinical evaluation report, uh, sorry, a clinical investigation or set up a clinical trial. So uh, for lower class devices, you can do a, I'm gonna stop some notification here. For lower class devices uh, from one, two A and two B, it's possible to get, gain clinical evidence by claiming equivalence. So equivalence is one of these words also that has um, a lot of gray areas and it's difficult to, the, any re regulatory consultant that you speak to may say that, well, equivalent means that you're absolutely the same and you, you're, you're actually uh, identical in every aspect, but, but that's, that's not my experience and that's definitely not the, the interpretation of the notified bodies that we work with because there, you also have to have a pragmatic approach and say that you're trying to place your device in this um, um, global environment of, of a lot of medical devices. And you try to say, 
uh, is there anybody like you uh, out there? And if there's somebody like you, can we find some type of predicate? Uh, in uh, FDA is using the word predicate and, and in, in the Europe, we don't use that as a terminology. We speak about equivalence. But anyway, you're trying to, to, to sort of say that I'm, I'm like somebody else. I'm not exactly like somebody else. And here are the differences. And you try to do a gap analysis between where you are similar and where you're differentiating and you are rationalist, of course, to say where we are differentiating and where we are not the same, it's not going to negatively impact the safety and performance of our device. That's how you work with equivalence. So you try to find devices or products that are similar to you and you do a literature review and you look for data and clinical evidence on these products. Uh, you can look in the public databases and you can look it at um, uh, competent authority uh, databases where adverse events are reported. You can use uh, guidelines uh, that are issued from, from, for example, a cardiology society if your device is related to the cardiovascular segment. But basically, if you go and look for data, um, peer-reviewed articles, you do a literature review and, and you go to some of these databases that we put here. You use PubMed, you can use the Cochrane Research, you can look at uh, clinical trials and other. There are more databases that you can look for data in. But you need to do it in a methodological way. You follow the medical device guidance document. It's MedDev 27, uh, 271 Rev 4. Uh, and especially there's a methodology that describes that you need to look for both favorable data and unfavorable data. And it's not up to you to determine what's favorable and unfavorable. You need to follow the methodology and you apply the different criteria and what comes out needs to be explained, both from data that will support your technology and data that may speak against your technology. So you use something called the PICO strategy. So for example, you can use that. There are the strategies, but this is a very common strategy. And you are identify your patient population, your intervention, the comparator, and your outcome. And when you have that, which you basically get from your intended purpose, what your device is supposed to do, who your device is supposed to treat, and what you hope that your device will do, which is the outcome, you establish a number of keywords and you perform a uh, you put these keywords in and basically you get a lot of hits could be millions of hits or hundreds of thousands of hits and then you have to start and uh, sort these hits that you have and you apply more and more criteria to try to get down to a number of um, references that you can bring into your last phase of appraisal and analysis and that that forms the basis of your conclusion on the device so um, here I said other sources of clinical, there's a lot to say more about how to do cl the clinical review, but you know, this is not the forum to, to go into too many details, but basically the take home message is that you need to follow the MedDev 271-Rev4 on that. It's a medical device uh, guidance document. So other sources of clinical evidence, I said you can look at uh, adverse events registered in the, um, the European authorities' website. So for example, Swiss Medic. In Spain, we have the IAMS website. In Germany, we have B-Farm. In UK, also they have their competent authority website. In the US, the medical device website where adverse events are reported is called the MOD database. I'm sure you've heard about that. So there are different... Um, uh, uh, sources that you have to go to. The hope is that all of this will be streamlined into the UDAMED, uh, the huge database that the European Union uh, on, on behalf of the European Commission are building. So that's been kind of delayed. I don't know now what the latest status is that the MDR got delayed. Also the, the UDAMED is also uh, I think they have their time to finish and get online, but uh, it's, I think it's going to be a, an incredible resource. If it works the way that we believe that it will, or we hope that it will, of course, that will streamline and we will have a lot of clinical evidence already focused and as accessible in this database. So there's a difference between adverse events and incidents. So incidents are device malfunctions that occur outside of a clinical investigation. So they are called, they're not called adverse events, but rather incidents. Then you have data from your post-market surveillance phase. 
So you can collect them either in the post-market clinical follow-up phase uh, during a post-market clinical trial. So this is a new acronym, the PMCF, post-market clinical follow-up. Or you can even have data uh, collected in your internal um, quality management system through your CAPA, your corrective and preventive actions. So that is also information that you is relevant and, and that you collectively as a, as a company and as a regulatory team have to decide uh, what do we have and how can we access it and how can we analyze it and how can we get it into a, um, a format that is methodological and that we can reproduce um, over the life cycle of a device, but also within our company. Finally, then we have the registers uh, from hospitals and health authorities, uh, other authorities, and then we mention again the UDAMED at the end. So just a few words on the UDAMED, perhaps you already you know what it will be about, but basically it's this beautiful castle that we're building in Europe that has uh, a lot of different pillars. So you see it will contain the registration of uh, devices, it will contain the certificates, the CE mark certificates that's issued by the notified bodies or um, competent authorities if it's issued by, by, the, by the national competent authorities. It will include information on vigilance and post-market surveillance. It will include market surveillance. It will include the information from the clinical investigations on devices uh, performed in the European Union. So all of this uh, will build this database and then of course this the traceability of what's happening with the devices is managed through this new unique device identifier the udi so i think that's enough about this it's the same both under the mdr and and the ivdr which is the, is the in vitro diagnostic regulation i think we had a detail here it's delayed until the implementation uh, in May 2022. So, okay, one year afterwards, uh, when we have now MDR planned, May 26, 2021. Um, I think uh, UDAMED will comprise of a total of six areas that will be accessible to the medical device manufacturer. So you can see there is the re registration area it's the UDI, it's the certificate information, the investigation part, vigilance and post-market surveillance. So these are basically the pillars that I presented in the previous slide. So how do we pre prepare a clinical evaluation plan, a SEP? So uh, how much time do I have left? Can you let me know? Yeah, two, I mean, you can finish in two or three minutes. That will okay. be okay. Perfect, thank you. So this is an overview of what you have to do um, to in your clinical evaluation. So, and this has to be uh, presented and uh, digested and nicely presented in a clinical evaluation plan. So you have your preclinical phase, you have your clinical phase and you have your market phase. So of course, in your preclinical phase, before you end up in the hospitals, you have your invention, your prototype, you had a great idea and you did your discovery and you bring that into your preclinical studies. It can be benchtop testing, it can be animal testing. It's a lot of testing activities going on here, but the outcome of that is a very important document, which is called the investigator's brochure. Here you're collecting everything, description of your device and everything related to the preclinical testing. So now you go into clinical development and here you're also including a clinical investigation plan and your clinical development plan. And, and, and your clinical evaluation plan will uh, include information from your preclinical phase, basically everything that you have summarized in your investigators for sure. So you should leverage that as far as possible. You don't need to go and, and reinvent the wheel or uh, try to complicate things you know, more complicated than they are. Take the information you have from your investigator for sure and put that as part of your clinical elevation plan or your SEP. Then you bring in your clin clinical investigation, your SIP, which is your clinical investigation plan, previously called protocol, but it's basically what you launch at the clinical sites or the hospitals, deciding how, how, the, uh, how you want to uh, develop or how you want to run your clinical 
trial at the hospital and then you include also your post-market uh, phase so the pmcf your post-market surveillance or your post-market clinical follow-up phase it's basically your post-market study so you can here design a post-market clinical follow-up study that you also feed in to your clinical evalu evaluation plan you're saying what are we also going to do post-market and all of this data uh, that you collect preclinical, clinical, and post-market feeds into, into your SEP. And the SEP is sort of your, um, it's your manual for how you're planning to follow uh, what's happening with your device in the clinical setting, pre, during, and in the post-market setting. So preclinical, in the clinical setting and once you're commercialized. Because now, according to MDR, you have a responsibility as a manufacturer to, to really know everything that's happening with your device uh, over the life cycle of the device, from the innovation or discovery phase until the decommissioning. So that's uh, really important to, to involve both R&D and regulatory and even quality when you're writing this, uh, of course, quality when you're writing this plan. I, I meant to say even marketing when you're writing this plan because they know perhaps how you are planning to market the device. And then there's, I just have a few more slides. And then there's a new requirement that within the post-market setting, uh, according to the MDR, we're going to have to release now this uh, SIR. So it's periodic safety update reports. Uh, that is also going to be a requirement that we submit into the UDAMED uh, database once that's available. But you already need to prepare to have a methodology and a process in place within your company to, to generate these SIRs once uh, they are required. Um, this is a little bit what I spoke about. So basically, you have to think about what are the general safety and performance requirements, the GSPR that Eduardo mentioned. You have to take into purpose, uh, in place the intended purpose of the device, your target groups and the benefits. A little bit what we already spoke about before. So let me scroll forward. Uh, I think I focused on this already when we spoken about the literature review. So for the literature review then, so uh, just to summarize, when you do a literature review, when you, the first phase of collecting your clinical data, so you develop the search strategy, you do the PICO framework, you conduct the search in the databases, you identify the data pertinent to, to your search strategy, and you weigh them and you appraise them and you summarize them into your clinical evaluation report. So this is a little bit who we are. We, just as the previous speaker, we're based in Spain, we're based in Madrid, and we provide both clinical and regulatory consulting. I'm Swedish myself, but the rest of the team, they're Italian, uh, Portuguese, Spanish. We even have a girl from Romania. And yeah, so we speak fluently eight languages. Um, and I hope we could help you and that you find this presentation valuable. And if you need any feedback, please don't hesitate to, to get back to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. So we will make later the presentation and the video. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. For that. So I have here the uh, question uh, in, in this case is, uh, for Juan uh, is an entrepreneur, is Juan Cabrera, and uh, it's for Eric, uh, Eric that is still here. So uh, he's, uh, well, let me give you a, a little background about this company. This company uh, has a drug that is Baritena that he was able to, to sell it uh, uh, last year to Boston Scientific uh, for more or less 4.2 billion. So Juan can correct me. Anyway, and now he's uh, thinking uh, in doing an apparatus, a microphone generator, and that will be a medical device. So Juan, if you want to ask. Yes, uh, Lourdes, hello, do you hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Yes, oh, yes, hello. yes, yes, we hear you. You are in Panama also, no? You are in the, in the same uh, time that Eric. <laughs> ah, there you go, you're in Panama, perfect. I'm here in this, in this, in this side. <laughs> um, um, congratulations for, for, for your presentation and it has been very, very interesting. Um, um, 
I, I have a question for, for Eric. Eric, um, some of us are worried about uh, going into the U US market because it is very competitive and because the, the uh, feeling about uh, going in is that it is going to be very expensive, etc. My as Lourdes, as Lourdes said, um, I have a background on, on drug development, but I did that together with a, a bigger company. I was the inventor, I was the, the entrepreneur in this case, but I, I did a, a joint venture with this bigger company. So um, I saw how millions of dollars were going from here to there, etc. So when, when uh, doing things uh, myself, um, some of us have the feeling that the US market is going to be um, um, very competitive, uh, very difficult. And uh, well, um, can, you, can you give me some advice if I am right? And <laughs> also, can you give me a, a, a complementary vision of the, of the friendly side? So um, your question or your concern is very broad based. And in some regards, yes, that is true, right? Um, it's competitive, um, you know, certainly from um, it's one of the largest uh, markets in the world, right? So yes, there are a lot of people in the market. And um, I would say, you know, I covered the regulatory aspects. I don't think the regulatory aspect is necessarily the difficult part here, right? Um, the challenges you have is really after you get your approval, depending on your, your product and your device, I'm generalizing here, not expensive, right? Um, most of the devices make it through the, the pre-market notification. For small companies that qualify, your fee is like, let's just say somewhere around $6,000 for the FDA to review and clear your product if it's a, if it's a class two. However, um, after um, clearance or approval through the FDA, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, certainly it is, it is competitive. And in particular, where a lot of companies struggle is on the reimbursement side, right? If you have something novel um, that you're introducing to the market that is not currently included in the code for reimbursement, I think that's certainly a challenge um, you know, for you as well. However, if there's an existing code, then, you know, it tends to be pretty seamless. But, um, you know, so I think the reimbursement is certainly a challenge. Distribution, um, you know, certainly costs a lot for companies to be able to be able to distribute effectively, whether you're doing that direct or as most people starting out do, um, they distribute through uh, through currently established, uh, established channels. So I guess my... Uh, uh, you know, my my uh, my point for you is is that the upfront work is not that onerous, depending on your product and your classification, um, but the actual execution to actually distribute your product can be uh, you know can be uh, difficult uh, for some companies to achieve. Does that kind of uh, answer your question? Yes, definitely, Eric. Uh, you went to the to the point, and <laughs> it is. Uh... Um, what uh, I needed to, to know. Um, okay. I must say that after listening to you, I feel really encouraged to, to move um, into the United States again. And uh, I told uh, Lourdes that uh, if possible, I would like to, to make a personal call with you. <laughs> to sure, tell happy to help out. And, and oh. um, an overview of what we need and we would like to do. Perfect. And, you know, listen, knowledge is, is powerful, right? At least if nothing else, understand, you know, where your product fits in and then you can make an informed decision on to move forward, not to move forward. Definitely. Eric, okay. you, you transmit the feeling that things are possible. And uh, I <laughs> have to tell you that it is what I need in myself at this moment. Thank you so much. Perfect. All right. Nice to meet you, Juan. <laughs> So that's very nice. And, and now to, to, to keep in this mood, that Francisco Rios, that is the CEO and R&D project manager in Biotronic Advance, he's going to tell us the, her successful story because he was able 
to, to register their medical device. In this case, it was CMARC, but now they are also thinking FDA. Um, Francisco, you can speak in the language that you want. Um, we really are happy that you are here because your company is a, a very a successful case at PTS Granada, and we are very happy that you are here. So, Francisco. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, sorry, guys, I'm, I'm going to, to, to talk in, in, in Spanish because uh, I feel more confidence uh, just to, to talk about, about the, the history of this adventure. <laughs> so, um, bueno, uh, yo quiero hablar o uh, contar a todo brevemente pues, uh, bueno, lo, 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 que significa, lo que significa meterse en una, en una aventura eh, como es eh, eh, bueno, conseguir el certificado, en este caso el CE eh, médico, de un, un, un producto sanitario. ¿no? Desde, desde que se concibe <coughs> eh, la idea como una compañía pequeña que somos, en Biotronic somos una empresa pequeña, <coughs> como muchos de los que supongo que, que me, estáis, me estáis escuchando, y, y bueno, desde que se concibe el, la primera idea de, hasta que se llega a poder certificar el producto, bueno, es una, es una aventura realmente eh, llena de, bueno, de preguntas, de cuestiones eh, y, y que requiere, y el tiempo luego al final lo, lo dice, pues, requiere muchísimo muchísima paciencia, mucho trabajo y mucho dinero también eh, para invertir. O sea, que, que hay que tener muy claro a la hora de, de meterse en un proceso así um, si, si merece la pena en, en, vamos, en temas ya empresariales, económicos, ¿no? si, si el retorno, por mucho que se quiera o, sea, o se tenga una idea estupenda y un producto que crees que funciona, um, si luego el mercado va a responder para, para una vez que consiga el certificado y haya invertido tanto, te va, te va a suponer un retorno. Entonces, bueno, es mejor plantearse estas cuestiones al principio de, del proceso que no, que no al final, ¿no? Que, que luego pues, se puede llevar uno eh, sorpresas porque, porque, bueno... Um, en concreto, lo que nosotros nos dedicamos es a fabricar equipos basados en radiofrecuencia, en emisión de, de radiofrecuencia, equipos ele electrónicos eh, dedicados a, bueno, pues son diatermia, láseres eh, para, para su uso en fisioterapia, en medicina del dolor y, 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 y todo esto. ¿no? Entonces, eh, eh, lo primero que... Bueno, en, en el que estamos ahora eh, finalizando ya eh, prácticamente pues, un, un dispositivo que se llama ABD modular y está, básicamente va a tener varias, varias funciones y, y bueno, está basado en radiofrecuencia, en emisión de radiofrecuencia y es, está para, o sea, va, va a ser usado pues, en fisioterapia, sobre todo en recuperación en medicina deportiva y para tratamiento de lesiones y, y tratamiento del dolor, ¿no? Entonces, pues, pues bueno, mmm, lo primero que hay que, que hacer cuando se tiene ya el dispositivo más o menos uh, ideado y, y pergeñado es, pues, pues bueno, lo, lo que he dicho, eh, hay, eh, hay que plantearse si <coughs> eh, este dispositivo va a merecer la pena que sea un dispositivo médico, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, en nuestro caso lo, lo teníamos claro eh, y, y, bueno, pues, pues nos metimos directamente a, a, a la aventura, un poco sin saber, sin saber cómo, cómo, cómo iba esto a, a acabar, ¿no? Pero, pero bueno lo primero que hay que hacer es eh, rodearse de, de gente que, que te, bueno, pues, como los ponentes que tenemos aquí, eh, que, te, que te apoyen en todo el proceso porque, como habéis visto, son un montón de pasos, de, eh, de trabajo que hacer eh, y, y la verdad es que hay un montón de, de procesos en los que uno se siente completamente 
completamente perdido. Eh, eh, se comienza con obtener, eh, por lo menos en España, la licencia previa de, de la agencia del medicamento. Sin ella no, no se puede considerar que fabrica un, un, un producto sanitario. Es como es un requisito adicional que, que, aparte de todos los requisitos que, que se necesitan, pues, pues la agencia del medicamento también emite la licencia, la licencia previa, que básicamente lo recomendable en este caso es tener ya un sistema de, de calidad implantado en, en la compañía porque va a facilitar mucho el cumplimiento de los requisitos para la, obtener la licencia, la licencia previa. Eh, eh, con ese puede ser la 9001 o si se es valiente se puede ya meter uno en el proceso de la 13485 así directamente y si se quiere ahorrar algo de, de tiempo pero yo desde mi experiencia quiero recomendable comenzar con la 9001 eh, que vaya que vaya implementándose en, en la empresa eh, como, como, un, como una rutina y, y luego pues a cometer la 13485 con, con alguna garantía más. Porque también pasa una cosa. Perdón. También pasa una cosa. Es que si se pone uno a, a sacarse la 13485 demasiado pronto, eh, es una dicotomía aquí lo que pasa. Porque es un requisito indispensable tener la ISO 13485 eh, para conseguir el marcado CE. Pero por otro lado, uh, si lo hace demasiado pronto, la 13485, o por lo menos en mi, mi opinión, eh, los auditores te, te miran mal, en el sentido de que ellos vienen a auditarte uh, un proceso de fabricación y de trazabilidad de un producto sanitario. De un producto sanitario que todavía no está fabricando porque uh, no tiene la 13485, entonces no tiene el marcado CE. Con lo cual resulta que no lo encontramos. Nosotros tenemos la 13485, pero para este producto en concreto, para, la, o sea, para el, el AVD modular, ah, como mmm, no se tenía el marcado CE, pues claro, uh, vienen, nos hacen las revisiones de o sea, todos los años y claro, mmm, vienen a ver un poco los datos de la fabricación, de la trazabilidad, de todos los... Y no podemos enseñarle nada durante el proceso porque... Todavía no hemos podido fabricar eh, como tal, ¿no? Entonces, un poco, uh, ¿qué, ¿qué antes? ¿El huevo o la gallina, no? O sea, ¿qué, qué, qué, se, ¿qué se tiene que hacer antes? Bueno, hemos ido un poco estableciendo un equilibrio y, y, y en fin, al final los, los, bueno, los, los auditores son comprensivos y, y bueno, pues esperan hasta que, y más con, con todo esto que se ha metido de la pandemia y tal, pues al final todo también se ha se ha alargado y, y bueno, eh, son comprensivos y, y bueno, pues al final hemos podido llegar a un, a un equilibrio. Eh, como hablaba antes de, de, bueno, de plantearse seriamente el retorno comercial de, de, de un producto sanitario. ¿sí? Entonces, otra de las cuestiones que yo lo veo como un consejo es intentar previamente a, a, a meterse en, el, en la aventura del de certificar un producto como producto sanitario, un marcado CE, intentar eh, encontrarle algún uso alternativo al producto que tiene eh, fuera, de, fuera de, ese, de esos requisitos tan, tan especiales ¿no? que, que tiene, para darle de alguna manera salida al, al producto eh, o alguna variante del producto y que, y que permita un poco comenzar y financiar eh, todo el proceso todo el proceso este. Uh, en nuestro caso, um, eh, hemos podido darle al, al, al producto otro, otro enfoque en el plano de, de la estética, ¿no? sacando una, pues, bueno, una serie de productos de, de radiofrecuencia pues, para tratamientos faciales, corporales y una división estética que ciertamente es la que, es la que ha apoyado y financiado un poco el, el, luego todo el proceso de... de porque, de, del producto sanitario, porque bueno, nuestra finalidad última es, era, era esa, sacar un producto sanitario, pero, pero bueno, el, la tipología de, de equipo que nosotros 
que nosotros fabricábamos nos ha permitido, con suerte, uh, poder, poder uh, sacar otros equipos uh, basados en radiofrecuencia y tal, que, que no tienen tanta, tanta regulación. Aunque todo esto va a cambiar y, y en los productos de estética también se va, se va a requerir cada vez más, más no sé, de buena tinta, vamos, cada vez más, más regulación. Eh, bueno, eh, como hablaba, eh, hay que obtener la licencia previa, la, la licencia previa la, la pide la agencia de medicamentos y otra de las cuestiones que hay que tener en cuenta en cuanto a la licencia previa es que eh, es susceptible de que, de que te hagan cambiar, pues, te, te analizan las instalaciones, donde fabrica y, y puede ser que te hagan cambiar cierta, ciertas cosas de las instalaciones, ¿no? O sea, que, que en donde tú, estás, tú vas a fabricar. En nuestro caso, por ejemplo, pues tuvimos que clausurar los locales donde fabricamos, tienen varias entradas y tuvimos que clausurar una, una entrada al, directa que había al laboratorio, pues porque, bueno con las regulaciones que hay y tal, no se podía, no se podía decir. Lo que quiero decir es que eh, a a, a, desde el principio ya hay que estar abierto a que van a surgir muchísimos cambios, no solamente en, la, en el equipo, porque eso es, esa es otra, es decir, eh, tenéis que estar seguros de que el proyecto que tenéis de, de equipo, su diseño inicial, uh, va a sufrir cambios durante el proceso de certificación, y, y cuanto más eh, seáis capaces de, de anticiparos a eso, uh, será mejor, porque bueno, los cambios, los cambios son, son costosos, pueden llegar a ser costosos y, y duros, pero, pero bueno, está claro que va a haber cambios en cada fase, e incluso no solo en el producto, sino también en los locales o en el sitio, en la fábrica o... Um, que se tenga, vamos, o sea, se puede, puede haber cambios de todo tipo. Uh, también hay que tener en cuenta desde el principio, si pensáis fabricar el producto en, en, en un solo sitio, en, el, en donde estáis, o vais a subcontratar otro, otros procesos que sean importantes, porque todo lo que subcontratéis va a ser susceptible de, también de, 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 vamos, de certificación, o sea que que, que eso también lo, lo tenéis que tener en cuenta. Eh, así como ya ha pasado el, el, el proceso de a los tener la licencia previa, que en nuestro caso nos llevó entre ida y venida así como un año, pues uh, porque la agencia del medicamento también responde cuando, cuando quiere, uh, pues bueno, ya nos, nos, nos metimos de lleno en lo que es el, el, el producto en sí, el mercado CE ¿no? de, del producto. En paralelo, pues bueno, ya teníamos la 13485 y, y, y bueno, lo que tuvimos también que tener muy en cuenta al empezar, sobre todo, es eh, que el sistema de gestión que tengáis implantado en la empresa, son pequeños consejos que os doy desde mi experiencia que me van surgiendo. El sistema de gestión que tengáis implantado en la empresa eh, lo tenéis que tener muy bien preparado para, para que os lleve una trazabilidad total de, de, del producto, del dispositivo. ¿no? Es decir, eh, que sea capaz eh, de, de absorber toda la información de lotes eh, eh, y, y, y discretizarlo muy bien y tenerlo todo muy bien ordenado porque eso va a ser un requerimiento que, que a posteriori puede ser un, un, un fastidio el, el tener que adaptarse, adaptar el, el sistema de gestión. ¿no? Entonces, eh, si se hace desde el principio, es eh, también un buen consejo, un buen consejo bueno, se pueden ahorrar bastantes preocupaciones. Eh, una vez que, no, que, que ya tenemos el prototipo y, y tenemos la licencia, y tenemos la 13485 o en paralelo um, a esto, eh, pues ya um, nos metemos en el, en el mundo de, de, pues del laboratorio, ¿no? lo, por donde hay que empezar, el laboratorio de, de compatibilidad electromagnética, de seguridad eléctrica y tal, eh, pues el encargado el que, el, el que os va a hacer toda la parte de ensayo, y, y bueno, um, ahí los puntos claves es tener preparado 
un análisis de riesgo exhaustivo, ¿no? porque lo van a solicitar en ese, en ese mismo momento. ¿no? En, en el momento de la ensayo de seguridad eléctrica van a, a requerir el, un análisis de riesgo que, que bueno, tiene, tiene muchísimo trabajo de, de, bueno, de identificar todo y cada uno de los riesgos, anticiparse a ellos. Eh, si el, el dispositivo, con nuestro, como en nuestro caso, tiene software, eh, también habrá ensayos de usabilidad y habrá que, que discretizar toda la, la usabilidad del software. Y, y sobre todo, el hándicap aquí eh, que veo es que eh, no se sabe, no puedes saber a priori cuánto tiempo te, va, te vaya a llevar esto. Es decir, es difícil eh, para una empresa, es muy importante saber o tener la mejor idea de cuánto tiempo te va a llevar cada proceso y cuánto dinero ¿no? te va a llevar también para, para establecer unos mínimos presupuestos. Pues bien, en este, en este proceso os digo que, que es muy difícil, muy difícil tanto en el laboratorio como muchísimo menos todavía en la parte de evaluación clínica, eh, saber a priori mmm, qué tiempo va a tardar y, y cuánto te va a costar. O sea que que estamos haciendo todo lo contrario que nos dicen que, eh, a los gerentes que, que tenemos que hacer en una empresa, que es hacer las cosas um, sin una planificación previa. Aquí, desgraciadamente, o por lo menos nuestra experiencia, es que uh, es muy difícil o casi imposible que alguien um, te arroje luz sobre, previamente sobre lo, que va, sobre lo que te va a costar esto, ¿no? en tiempo y en, y en dinero. Uh, en... Una vez que se pasa el, el, la parte de laboratorio, en paralelo, pues se debe ir eh, confeccionando ya lo que es toda la parte del technical file. Eh, bueno, el technical file comprende también la parte de laboratorio, pero bueno, ir montando toda la memoria del equipo, eh, planos, eh, toda la, todos los requerimientos que, que se quieren y sobre todo me paro en, en la evaluación clínica. ¿no? La evaluación clínica es, como bien decía María, <coughs> pues bueno, una de, la, de las partes fundamentales, uno de los, de los escollos más importantes que veo en, 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 toda esta, en, en todo esto, ¿no? Porque um, por lo menos nosotros eh, nos hemos topado con que hay eh, bastante desconocimiento por parte de, bueno, por parte de, de, los, de los que tienen la idea, es lógico, pero también incluso uh, con grupos de investigación, hospitales, grupos, grupos de investigación de hospitales, de universidades, los encargados de tener que, o sea, de hacer estudios de validación y todo esto, eh, no, no conocen verdaderamente, eh, o sea, pueden, pueden a lo mejor mm, saber hacer un estudio de investigación o algo, pero hacer una evaluación clínica como tal, montar una evaluación clínica, eh, no hemos encontrado con unas dificultades terribles para... Para, para poderla montar. Es decir, la labor de, de extraer todo, el, toda la, um, todo lo que hay, todo lo que implica de, de evaluación clínica alrededor de un, de, del equipo, como puede ser la bibliografía por un lado, las investigaciones propias por otro, qué estudios hacer, cuáles son los necesarios, cuáles no. Eh, al final, eh, eh, uno lo hace o lo conforma como mejor, como mejor eh, cree, ¿no? pero, pero queda a expensas del evaluador. O sea, cuando tú presentas el technical file al, al organismo notificado, pues un poco está a la espera de que el evaluador mmm, dé por bueno lo que ha justificado ¿no? en función de no sé todavía bien qué. Es decir, eh, bueno, en función de, de sus propios criterios ¿no? científicos, pero no hay, por más que se quiere discretizar una guía y todo esto, hay, luego en la práctica no hay, eh, verdaderamente te encuentras con un, con un, con un mar de dudas ahí de, de, qué, de qué hacer, qué añadir, qué poner, qué, qué quitar. Y como bien decía María, los estudios, los estudios las investigaciones científicas que, que haga alrededor de, del equipo cuesta mucho tiempo y dinero. Entonces no se puede estar tampoco dando palos de ciego en una u otra dirección sin, porque se puede eternizar. Entonces, bueno, es uno de los escollos más importantes que hemos encontrado en, en, el, en la parte esta de, del certificado. Y 
Bueno, como decía, al final de todo, monta el technical file, en nuestro caso lo traduce también al inglés, que es otro, que es otro, otra parte de presupuesto también, esa sí se puede controlar algo más. Eh, y, y al final lo presenta y la sensación que se tiene, por más que es que, bueno, pues lo presenta tu trabajo y queda en manos de los revisores, ¿no? De, eh, y, y nadie, por muy buen, por muy buen eh, consultor que sea, te puede dar garantía de que lo que estás presentando eh, pues va a gustar, ¿no? básicamente, o va a entrar a priori. Eh, entonces, pues bueno, es eh, un poco eh, quedar a la espera de, de que el revisor, pues, bueno, de, que, de que todo esté correcto, de que vea bien y si algo hay que <coughs> cambiar o justificar, pues, pues nada, estar atento para, para, lo, para los cambios. Nosotros ahora mismo en el ABD modular nos encontramos en ese punto, es decir, hemos, hemos entregado el technical file, lo bueno, entregamos en su momento... Y estamos a la espera de, de que el organismo notificado ya de, de que no, no haga, pues no dé lo que hay, ¿no? no haga la, tienen que, bueno, quedaría la revisión, que supongo que la están haciendo, y, y una auditoría que, presencial que tienen que venir. Nosotros la estamos haciendo en concreto con IMQ, que es el organismo notificado de, de Italia. Y con todo este proceso ha sido supervisado por... Pues, por este aquí es el que está por ahí, este aquí es el Olmos, que, que es de, de Homologic, y, y que bueno, que nos ha acompañado en todo este, este proceso y, y que, que bueno, que ha trabajado estupendamente. Bueno, estamos muy contentos con, con, con su trabajo. Eh, luego quedaría ya la parte del de mantenimiento de, ese, de todo este sistema, ¿no? 9001, 13485, en nuestro caso también. Tenemos la ISO de Medio Ambiente, la 166002, eh, marcado CE con, con su auditoría sorpresa también que tendremos y, y bueno, todos estos costes también adicionales que ya hay que mantener eh, con el tiempo. Y, y bueno, ahora mismo estamos mmm, encima pues con, con el tema de la, de la pandemia y todo esto, todos los plazos se han, se han ido, eh, vamos, todas las previsiones que se tenían aunque no se puede prever esto, pero ha sido un hándicap añadido ¿no? a, a esto, pero bueno, ya estamos viendo el final de, del proceso de este equipo en concreto y, y bueno, eh, cuando descansemos un poco y nos animemos, pues eh, cogeremos fuerzas para acometer la FDA con, <ríe> con Eric y, y bueno, y seguir, y seguir hacia adelante. Así que quedo Muchísima. a disposición para que... Muchísimas gracias, Francisco, porque eh, tu testimonio es muy interesante y voy a ir a la approval. And I have a question for all of you. So if a company, because these companies have a product that is a good product and is a global product, it makes sense to go to FDA and see Mark at the same time. Do you think that is too much or do you think because, I mean, if we are in a global market, for me, sometimes it makes sense. But what are your, or how can you think, or can, how can you encourage these people to, to go through all this process when you don't have the security that is going to be a success? I can go first on that. First of all, with the status of the United States right now, it's not secure at all because of the, the whole turbulence on the market. I mean, but that's by, by the way, I mean, uh, I think that, uh, This is the debate and this is the question that all manufacturers, big or small, they ask themselves. Do we go at both marks at the same time? Do we do first Europe and then the US? And, uh, uh, or do we do, do globally, you know, a study in Japan so we can suffice with the, for the Japanese regulatory agencies at the same time? It's very complex because there's not one answer and that's a boring answer, that there's not one answer that will fit every situation. It seemed more straightforward a few years ago that uh, because the C mark was faster and easier and you could get the C mark and you can start and get some revenue in Europe. And then with that money, you then went into the US market. So you could say with the MDR that, okay, that opportunity was reduced, but I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I don't even agree with that because I still think there's a tremendous 
benefit in, in trying to do a staggered approach and go to one continent before the other. And the, the truth is that even though with the MDR, uh, and it's more complex now, it's still, um, it's still, I believe, it's still more straightforward than going to the US. And I'm going to speak about specifically if you have to work with high class uh, uh, or high risk devices, because running a clinical trial in, U in the US and the United States and Canada, it's still so much more expensive than running a clinical trial in Europe. So the, the clinical trial cost is going to offset any type of perhaps more predictability with FDA because now with the MDR, we don't really know how they will react yet and so on. But if you are going with a high risk device, I think it's still favorable to try and start and do a staggered approach, especially if you're based in Europe. I, 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 would, I would never, if it was my company, I would not be based in Europe and start my first trial in the United States because the resources that you need are astronomical compared to what you need to run clinical trials in Europe. And I think also that the MDR, we had the, the, the big advantage that it was delayed a year and we have learned a lot. And, but we, we, we were sort of preparing for it to happen in May. So I think that once we are now uh, getting warm to it uh, in May next year, I think, I think we're gonna get back to a situation where uh, medical device approvals and C marking in Europe is a pre pretty predictable and straightforward process. So I think plan to be able to do, use your strategy, your clinical strategy in both markets that you can, it's really important that you can pool the clinical data. So set up your trial that it's compliant with GCP, with ISO 1415, with European MDR, and then also if it's if it's GCP compliant and ISO 14155 compliant, FDA is going to accept it. You know, so you can use your clinical data in both markets, uh, not just US and Europe, but but I mean in Asia because uh, we often just mention uh, US and Europe, but I mean uh, the data uh, quality that you need to enter Japan is also very significant. So. I think that's my point of view. Staggered approach and still, uh, especially if you're based in Europe, uh, go with Europe first and then try to get some revenue and, and start and sell your devices. Especially like uh, Eric spoke about before also, that the reimbursement in the US, it's, it, it, it can be more complex and you need to have a very strong sales channel. While in Europe, you, the, the European physicians have a better um, they have more flexibility when they want to start and use a device. They can determine more, you know, I want to try this. They have certain amount of budget that they can uh, spend on new products that doesn't have to come through a tender or through an insurance policy or, or some type of um, difficult to get reimbursement code. Mm -hmm. Sure. Eric, any feedback? Francis? Yeah, <clears throat> perfect. Let me add to um, Maria's. Cause in general, I agree with your comments, Maria, but I think there's a couple of points. Um, and let me give you my perspective from the U.S. looking back over to uh, to the EU, um, because I think it's it's changed certainly here, you know, as well. Listen, this comes back to generally, uh, if you've got a small company, you generally don't have the resources to do both at one time. Right. Um, that's been my experience. And a lot of the small companies I've worked with earlier on in my career, we did that strategy. We went to Europe first and then we did the U.S. Um, more recently, the view here in the U.S. has turned in that um, the, the ability to get clinical trials done in, in the EU and the process in the EU is not as favorable as it was previously. Um, and a lot of companies, US-based companies are electing to just stay in the US and, and start, you know, start doing that. There's very few companies that have been successful commercially, US-based companies, you know, commercially successful in the EU in the first, you know, few years of, of marketing. So I, I fundamentally agree. If you're EU based and you feel like you've got a good good handle on that, you know, um, on the EU side, certainly, you know, pursue that avenue. But I think there's a couple of points that, um, you know, that, that I, um, you know, that I want to make. 
number one is, you know, knowledge is, is power here, right? So there's nothing wrong with a company understanding how they fit in. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Maria, if it's a, if it's a class three device, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult, very arduous, you know, mm -hmm. process. If mm -hmm. it's class two, mm -hmm. um, that's a much different kind of situation for a company. So, you know, regardless, you should at least, uh, I would, I would uh, appeal to, to the companies out there to understand what classification they are and how clear the path is for you. Whether you execute on that or not, um, you know, is, is obviously up to you, but at least understand what your what your path is so you can make an informed decision. The second point I wanted to make was your comment about the clinical data. And this is just my experience and, you know, um, doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, involve all situations. The FDA has always asked me to have some number of sites in the US. And I think that's true for class three devices. In other words, if you're a lower class, a class two device and you do need clinical data, I think you'll be successful with using that data in the US. Mm -hmm. If you're class three, they're generally gonna want, uh, you know, the programs I've been involved with, it's half your sites, um, a third of your sites US based to support that that approval. And again, it's important to look at that from a class three standpoint. I don't think that's true on class two, but if you're at the highest classification, the FDA is gonna want you to use some sites in the US. So yeah. something, to, something to consider. Now that doesn't mean you can't come up with a strategy like Maria suggested of, of you know, using EU data and maybe you do some some, some smaller study in the U.S. as a follow-up. Yeah. Try to roll it in or something you, you, to, to not get blocked by. You know, many times the the, the price tag of you of setting up everything in the U.S. it, it sort of um, it scares investors away. It's, it, it it blocks you before you even started. So that's really. But I completely agree. It's always beneficial if you can start the, uh, the study and then you roll in and you you do mm -hmm. it. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's almost like you know, like we spoke about before. It's uh, it's almost like out of courtesy, even if there's no scientific base that you know there that the quality of the data would be different or user sites would behave differently. I think it's it's almost it's just because it's yeah. expensive. Yeah, and again, you know, use that pre sub process. I spent a lot of time on the pre sub. My examples of using mm -hmm. that pre sub process. That's something that will cost a company not a whole lot of money. And at least you'll get some insight on where you stand and then you can make a decision so but this, uh, i think it was uh, you said also eric before you need to analyze where do you want to take your device what's the market where where is your buyer what's the potential and so on and you have to adjust your 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 hunger after the you know the, the food you're bringing so to say you you have to you have to try to, to, yeah. to fit it into the budget. Yeah. Yeah, my experience, it used to be, oh, we got the approval, right? We got the clearance and, you know, we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Right now that, you know, in the U.S., that's the start of your process, right? Mm -hmm. That's the start of your journey. Yeah. The FDA is one piece, you know, mm -hmm. you have to design clinical trials and, and to be able to, if you need to establish a code or you need to use it for reimbursement, mm -hmm. your clinical trial needs to have not only what the FDA is looking for, but what the regulator, what the uh, insurance companies are looking yeah. for and they need to to adopt so there's a lot there's certainly a lot to it but again understand first where you fit in um mm -hmm. you know from a st strategic standpoint mm -hmm. okay so, thank you thank you so much Lourdes, <laughs> i think could i make a comment just yes, to, sure. to what francisco was saying about the clinical evaluation about how how the auditor almost has a, have a subjective review of your of your data, you know, and I think that's completely true, Francisco. It's it's uh, uh, you, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not so lucky, and we think that with all the regulations we have, why should we depend on on luck? It's 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 paradoxical, mm -hmm. but uh, it's uh, I think that what's helpful, and and I always try to highlight this and stress is that you know the European the documentation towards the CE mark it's almost all about traceability. So mm -hmm. do your very best to have traceability in everything that you do. And also the easier it is for an auditor. So format is important, uh, the layout, making sure that you don't have unnecessary mistakes in spelling or this or that or page. I mean, it's a lot of things that we take for granted, but mm -hmm. the moment it, it's almost like in your tax declaration, the moment that you sort of 
give them a reason to be concerned, they just get pissed off and they go into details. But if mm -hmm. they give them sure. no reason, everything is traceable, everything is perfect, you present everything in the format that they want to see it, you have a much higher chance of, of just having a favorable review because they like what they see. Yeah, sure. <laughs> thank and, you. Yeah, I think that's just one thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to all the speaker and to all the question and comments. It uh, was a pleasure to have all of you here. Um, really was very formative and uh, thank you so much. Thanks Bye a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice to meet everyone. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.